Well, it's 12.03. Allie, do you want to get us started? Absolutely. Um, and then just a reminder, it, it may have popped up on your screen, but we are recording this session. So um, if you'd like to mute yourselves um, or black out your video and you would not like to be recorded, please take a moment to do so at this time. Fantastic. Well, I'm Ali Stefanik. I'm the Assistant Director of Waterfront Programs at Independent Seaport Museum, and I am so excited to welcome all of you to our conversation today. Um, we're here for about an hour and we have lots of really interesting things to jump into. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to take a moment to um, just acknowledge that uh, Independent Seaport Museum is located on the ancestral lands of the Lenni Lenape, and they were the original caretakers, not just of the land, um, but of the Delaware River, which not only supplies our museum with lots of interesting content for you to consume, but is also the life force be behind our entire city of Philadelphia and the greater Philadelphia region. Um, so I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the original caretakers of that land and water um, and to recognize the legacy of violence that brought Independent Seaport Museum to its location. Um, and to state too that, you know, I'm calling from about an hour away from Philadelphia and I'm still calling in from what was originally also Lenny Lenape land. Oh, I'm actually gonna turn it over now to Alexis Furlong, our Director of Marketing and Communications to give you a little bit of more context about why we're here. Ali. Um, so as Ali said, my name is Alexis. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications. Um, and today's event is part of a larger um, observation, remembrance ceremony for us. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, Independent Seaport Museum, we are a maritime history museum located right along the Delaware River on the Penn's Landing waterfront. Um, and as a maritime history museum, you can expect that we have boats. Um, and right now we are stewards to two National Historic Landmark ships, one being Cruiser Olympia. Uh, she currently is the oldest floating seal warship in the world, uh, as one of only two ships left from World War I. Um, and as right before being decommissioned in the mid 1920s, was assigned with the task of bringing home an American unknown soldier from World War I home from France to be buried at Arlington Cemetery in the spot for the unknown soldiers that we all know today. So throughout the year 2021, we are examining difficult journeys home um, and remembering Olympia's journey. It's a little known story, um, but in short, she and her crew on board faced two different remnants of hurricanes um, and was almost lost at sea during the journey home across the Atlantic. Um, so with that concept in mind, we are examining throughout the year Different, uh, different types of difficult journeys home. Um, whether you are an African-American soldier, you're a woman veteran, or just you know, a, a veteran coming home and the um, kind of change back to civilian, like non-combat duty kind of, um, in a sense. So we're really excited to have you all here with us today. Um, we have really great partners that have helped us make this program come to life. So I'm going to turn it over to Steven from Opera Philadelphia. Thanks so much, Alexis. It is a really pleasure to be with you and to collaborate on this event. Um, you know, this can, combines not only our two organizations, but a third organization, which I'm really excited to, to speak about in a little bit. Um, you know, I thought maybe to start, it might be good to get a sense of who's with us in the audience. Certainly, I'm seeing some faces that are familiar from the Opera Philadelphia side, um, but also because we're here to talk about, uh, you know, the series, this brown bag series that Ali and Alexis have started back at the beginning of 2021, uh, was about uh, looking at you know this journey home through various types of media, and they became uh, aware of this opera, this filmed opera, uh, Soldier Songs by composer David T. Little, and uh, this has been something that's been available for on-demand viewing through the Opera Philadelphia channel since January. Uh, but you know, and a lot of people have come to to watch this, so I just thought it'd be good to um, get a sense of who joining us has uh, been able to watch Soldier Songs um, in advance of today's program, just by a show of hands, perhaps. 
That's great. And I'm moving into great. This is a good number. Uh, and also, you know, who joining us also might be an active military service member or a veteran themselves. Um, by a show of hands, if you feel so comfortable. Um, yeah, so I'm seeing about half and, and not taking into account those who are, um, you know, not showing their camera as well. You know, I, I want to take a moment to, um, because of today's proximity to the upcoming Memorial Day holiday, I wanted to take a moment to um, acknowledge this holiday, which began back in the Civil War uh, with the decorating of tombstones uh, to honor those who had died um, as a result of, of defending this country and um, who had fallen during war. And uh, this is a time to honor all those who have died serving this country and also a time to acknowledge the the grief that family and friends of those um, who had close relationships with veterans um, are feeling right now and the great burden and sorrow and pain that they have. Um, I just wanna offer that this community here, this space honors uh, those, those memories and uh, acknowledges and brings comfort during what is a trying week ahead. And um, so, so just giving some space for that given our conversation, given uh, this subject, I thought would be important. I also kind of failed to acknowledge who I am too as well. Um, perhaps I'm a new face. Uh, my name is Stephen Humes. I'm the manager of audience development for Opera Philadelphia. I work closely with our communications and marketing department, as well as our, our really robust community initiatives program. And um, Soldier Songs premiered as a film on the channel. And as I said, in January, of 2021 this this year um, and it's a piece that has been a collaboration between Jonathan McCullough uh, baritone and director as well as the composer David T. Little and a whole crew of artistic teams and, and um, visionaries to take this story and to bring it uh, to so many different audiences and so I thought I would um, First, take a moment to introduce Jonathan McCullough. Um, Jonathan is a longtime member of the Opera Philadelphia family, having performed in numerous roles over his time. You know, Jonathan has uh, performed internationally with uh, different companies in Berlin um, and has brought a real vision to this uh, program. So, Jonathan, just welcome and, and hello to you. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here. Great. And as I also mentioned in my opening comments, this is a collaboration between the Independent Seaport Museum, Opera Philadelphia, and Warrior Writers, uh, this incredible organization that uh, offers a number of different programs uh, and in collaboration with veterans and veteran artists. And I'd like to, uh, before we dive into a conversation about Soldier Songs itself, we welcome another special guest from the Warrior Writers uh, family and community. Um, I thought we would hear from Glynis, then we're gonna dive into what is Soldier Songs for those of you who might uh, be new to this film, this story, this opera. And then we'll, we'll open this up to really a question and answer. Uh, we've got a couple pre prepared, but perhaps you're entering this and hearing the theme of this brown bag series uh, with new questions in mind. So without further ado, you know, Glynis, uh, welcome, welcome to you. Hi, I'm Glynis. Uh, thank you for having me and inviting Warrior Writers into this conversation um, and event. Warrior Writers is a national veterans focused arts nonprofit. Our headquarters is here in Philadelphia. That's where our office is, but we have a national presence all around the country. Um, our mission is to create a culture that articulates veterans experiences, build a collaborative community for artistic expression and bear witness to war in the full range of military experiences. Um, so we do that by providing workshops, um, mainly writing workshops that provide prompts um, for veterans to come and in a safe community, talk about experiences, write about them, process them, share, build um, camaraderie. Um, so we do mostly writing workshops, but we also have uh, visual art and we host retreats. Wellness is a large part of what we do. So incorporating um, meditation, things like that to really serve the whole person um, in this journey for discovery and using art as healing and transformative power. Um, 
you can learn a lot more about us on our website, warriorwriters.org. We've also um, published several anthologies, works of veteran um, artists, and a large part of our mission is also about bridging the gap between veterans and civilians. So we host um, performances, readings, um, music performances, things like that, um, participating in panels like this, um, to sort of so allow to uplift veteran voices to speak for themselves as too often um, they aren't given that and the narrative is given for them. Um, and so we really wanna make sure that that is being conveyed to civilians and bridge that gap so that we can heal together as a community. Um, I'm joined here today by um, one of the members of our community, a wonderful um, artist, playwright, and performer, former Marine, um, Jeff Key. I don't know if you want to give a little introduction or Stephen, if that's the program now or later, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Jeff, welcome. Uh, you know, I've had the, since learning last week that you'd be joining us, uh, I've had the opportunity to uh, learn a little bit about your background through um, documentaries that are available around you, but it's uh, a real uh, honor to be with you and, and thank you for participating in today's conversation. Um, I don't know if you wanted to uh, say anything, uh, give you the opportunity to introduce yourself as well uh, before we dive into Soldier Songs. Um, yeah. Oh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. I, I don't want to talk anymore about myself, but just uh, uh, briefly to say thank you very much for inviting me to today and um, uh, I'm in I'm in the Los Angeles. I live in Hollywood and in New Orleans. And the uh, as I, this is the time of year I approach a Lakota Sundance that I go to. And so I would like to honor the Gabrielino, the Gra Gabrielino, uh, the um, the Kits and the Tongva people who uh, who on whose land I, I sit today, and to honor them uh, and to acknowledge uh, so much of of opera and so I studied voice in college is centered in the breath and the words of George Floyd echo today on the uh, one year anniversary of his murder. I'd like to uh, to honor George Floyd and our efforts to move forward in that area. And to say to you personally, Jonathan, thank you for the, your beautiful voice and your beautiful work. I, I promise to completely watch. I've had to watch in piecemeal because um, some of it's difficult as a veteran, and uh, but it is a beautiful piece, and I look forward to finishing it, and, and I look forward to the conversation with all of you today. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for offering all of those those remarks, and you know I'm really excited to dive into the question and answer because there's so many synergies between both you, Jeff, and Jonathan, with your background, Jeff, in, in performing arts and voice, and then the theme of of today's conversation. Um, but we're going to get to that in just a moment. I think for right now we're going to take about 10 minutes to just set a set a context for Soldier Songs, the story, its creation, and um, wondering, we have a, a video prepared, Jonathan, but also do you want to kind of set the scene for, for you know, the creation of this project um, for our audience? Uh, sure. So um, I'm trying to think, it was about two summers ago, I, I had this idea of, of um, I, I, let me back up again. I'm great at telling the story as you can tell, right? <laughs> so, um, my fiance, uh, is a psychiatry resident who works with veterans a lot at the VA. And, <clears throat> um, you know, the, what I kind of saw secondhand, obviously, is that like, you know, there's this, this system is, uh, is overwhelmed. Um, and, Unfortunately, it ends up, you know, being a, a it, it can tend to be quite an unfortunate situation because of the lack of resources just available just because the, there, there are so many people who need help, and only so many people, uh, so many hands around. Um, so I, I kind of saw that she was helping people uh, as much as she can on, on a on an individual basis with her set of skills, of which I obviously do not have. Uh, <laughs> so I said, what what can I do? um to to help because i i felt helpless um so i thought well you know I, I i can't administer therapy or really i don't know any of that kind of stuff but what i can do is maybe uh as cliche as it sounds but lend my voice to trying to get this 
this message across of uh, just raising awareness of what veterans actually go through when they uh, do try to reintegrate back home. Um, and that's something that, you know, I as a civilian, I have not served, um, but as a civilian, I always kind of thought, yeah, no, I, I know what it, what, yeah, you, you know, you see all the movies and stuff and it's, and people are fighting in, in wars and they come back and it can be difficult, but, it, but you don't really understand the, uh, the, how, just how difficult and how, what these situations are overseas until you actually talk to people who have experienced them. Um, and what stuck out to me so much about hearing soldier songs the first time before I made this film was the very opening line, uh, which is this dark gravelly voice that just goes, I never talk about this with anybody. I never talk about this with anybody. And uh, that kind of stuck out to me because what's really unique about this show is that it uses the firsthand accounts of veterans telling their stories integrated into the actual libretto and uh, and soundscape because David T. Little, the composer, really um, as a composer is quite genius and, and mixes the these words of recordings along with the instrumentation. Um, so what Soldier Songs kind of does is it, it takes a, an overarching view of the lifespan of uh, one person, but it's actually kind of a conglomerate of multiple people seen through the lens of this one individual. Um, going through uh, childhood, playing with G.I. Joe, saying, I want to be a real American hero, um, kind of idealizing this idea of war and how fun it can be. Uh, and then going into uh, playing violent video games, uh, again, kind of getting lost in that world. And then um, being uh, deployed and in a tank and all of a sudden having the realities of war um, strike quite suddenly and harshly uh, and realizing that kind of the realities of war are not anything what he's uh, been sold previously. Um, and then we shift into the elder's point of view um, of, a, of a father who has lost um, a son coming back from war. And if you haven't seen the movie, I don't really want to give anything away. <laughs> but um, all of these scenes are based on uh, real experiences from from people. So everything that you see happen in this in this uh, movie is something is somebody's story. Um, so my kind of goal in doing this was to hopefully uh, shed light on this mental health aspect, which was not necessarily what is woven into the libretto. But I so, so I took it as the he's the elder the entire time, and he looks back at his entire life through a series of um, dissociation and PTSD flashbacks. Uh, and so what I'm hoping to do in this film is basically raise the awareness um, for mental health, especially amongst veterans, because it can be quite difficult to, uh, to talk to someone. There's a kind of a stigma that goes around, especially now in this mental health awareness month of May. Um, along with, if you are a civilian like myself, uh, hopefully seeing um, the situation of, of veterans coming back home and reintegrating and what they actually go through, um, through a new lens with uh, maybe a, a, an increased sense of empathy for um, the just the situational context of what many people go through. Not everyone, of course, everybody has their own very unique story. Um, but that's the, basically based on these five um, veterans accounts of their lives. So that's kind of where where this all kind of started yeah thank thank you so much I, we're gonna actually watch a three and a half minute uh film that brings the composer's voice uh david t little uh, just providing a little bit more context to to the film and then we'll dive into a little bit more of our question and answer Soldier Songs began in 2004 at my high school in New Jersey. I was visiting uh, to talk about being a composer as part of a career day. And there was this, a display case in the hallway. And in that display case, where normally there would be pictures of the football team or the prom, were photographs of people I knew who I had gone to school with who were at that time fighting the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. 
And suddenly war and the military in general, which had always felt somewhat distant to me, felt immediately personal. And it was confusing for me. It was a confusing feeling. And I felt that I needed to explore that. And because I'm a composer, I explore things like that by writing music. So I asked people I knew, uh, including some uncles who had been in, in Vietnam, including my grandfather. And as I spoke with them, and as they told me stories, certain commonalities emerged. And those things that emerged became the kind of core of the piece. So it really came out of asking questions. And I think the piece itself asks a lot of questions, and I, I think it tries to not answer them, but just to leave them out there as questions for each of us as listeners to answer, and as listeners and as citizens, as individuals in the world, to sort of answer for ourselves, while at the same time acknowledging that what these individuals did and continue to do is quite difficult and has an impact, has a toll. You know, from, from very young ages, we're introduced to this idea of war and how it's just a normal part of life by playing with action figures or video games that are set in war zones. I first met Jonathan in 2016. He was performing in some scenes from my opera Dog Days, which were being presented as part of Opera Philadelphia's double exposure program. This is when I was composer in residence. And I was immediately struck, not just by his amazing musical uh, abilities and commitment to performance, but also by uh, his attention to the physical demands of performance. And really, he just threw himself into this role. And I was you know, in, immediately a huge fan, and I'm thrilled that we now have this opportunity to work together. By presenting this production of Soldier Songs, which tells the first-hand account of a soldier's life, I'm hoping to bring awareness to the mental health needs of veterans. It's estimated that 22 veterans die by suicide every single day in the United States. This is really a pressing issue, and I think a lot of people just aren't aware of it. I think for me, Soldier Songs has gotten increasingly difficult because I know everyone whose voices we hear. I know all of these individuals who sat down with me, who talked with me. Some of them are no longer with us. My grandfather passed away last year. And so it, it's, it's very personal and it, it continues to be, it sort of gets more personal in a way as, as we all move forward in time. Great. Jonathan, watching that, which was produced, uh, you know, in the summer of 2020, I think, correct? Yeah. Um, what comes to mind for you? And, you know, <clears throat> do you now, um, I guess my question is, you know, has your participation in this film informed your understanding of veterans and military service? How, how has your participation you know, continued to, to develop um, over this period of time? I mean, I think it's something that I, I, I think I'm more familiar with, with the general concept, but again, it's something that I will never be able to, I think, fully understand, not having lived, lived it. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's thinking back over, I mean, this project has kind of been uh, all encompassing in my life, basically for the past two years. <laughs> and, um, and it's, you know, I've, you know, when going through the post-production process, uh, you know, through filming, through pre-production filming and post-production, we, uh, you know, I, I watch the movie over in every little frame uh, in minute detail, maybe, oh, maybe 40 times. So it's, it's th these words actually, it, what's interesting is that it never gets stale because these words from these people just kind of uh, haunt you almost in, in the best way, but, but there's something just so real about it that I find a lot the the with opera in general, it's usually, you know, a story of um, uh, unimaginable uh, either fantasy or, or uh, 
the, the storybook or whatever you know the situations are usually not uh <laughs> um real life situations uh but this one is just really different in that sense which i think makes it just kind of omni relevant um especially coming up on something like uh, memorial day or veterans day or um really anytime you pass a, a, a veteran <laughs> period like you know um and which is why i wanted to kind of take this this, this idea of uh <clears throat> setting it in a in a trailer um in a very isolated way and how this kind of uh how i wanted the audience to see how easily a, a downward spiral can occur through no fault of of the individual um and so it's kind of like you know when I, whenever i if i see someone a, a homeless person on the side of the road and it says you know homeless veteran please help it, it's it's kind of like you you want to know more about that person and more into who they actually are and how and how this happened and and mm -hmm. what led what events led to that because I, I i mean i i think back when i was when we when around the time that video was made i saw a, a video of a of a bernie sanders rally and there was a veteran there uh who had i think it was non-hodgkin's lymphoma or some something that was just i mean like a, a death sentence disease and he happened to get called on and he had this medical bill in his hand and he said uh well what, what, what's going on with you and he said i have whatever the non-hodgkin's lymphoma and something happened along the way where i i didn't sign a piece of paper or something and i've been a i, I served for 20 years and i i was always promised that i was going to be taken care of when i came back and uh and he forgot to sign something one day that maybe got lost in the mail. I don't know. And, mm -hmm. uh, and he said, I have a bill here for, I think it was $125,000. And I said, I can't afford this. And Bernie Sanders said, well, what, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to kill myself. And, uh, and he said, you know, please, please don't do that. Um, we'll, we'll figure this out. And luckily he got in touch with the representatives in Nevada. I think it was where, where this guy lived and they ended up sorting the whole thing out and he saw him later at a rally and he said everything worked out and he gave him his uh his airman's jacket hmm. and he was like no please keep this but he was basically i i owe my life to you because i literally the only way out was was by suicide in his eyes yep. um and it kind of just really struck me that that this guy who's going through this horrible situation who served for 20 years of his life and then came back and then was just basically like the only way out is this. Um, and he happened to get called on on a rally that happened to get worked out and he still has a terminal illness and he's the lucky one. Uh, that kind of just really sat with me and still sits with me whenever I think about this, this show and movie that, that there are so many people who don't get called on. Um, who go through these kind of situations, uh, and you know, there there are resources that uh, that people can reach out to, and it's just a, a matter of people being aware and people lending out a helping hand. Um, just you know, even if it's somebody sitting on the on the ground saying like, you know, I I, I need help, and say, let me talk to you and help you. Um, so that's Thank kind you. of what I wanted to get across with this because it's it's. It's a great piece, obviously, and it stands alone in that, but I wanted to kind of um, add this element of mental health help uh, to the production. Yeah. Jeff, I want to bring you in uh, and kind of offer, you know, you and Jonathan to, to you know, connect in any way. Don't feel like you need to wait for the question to speak or, um, and I'd also invite those joining us, uh, if you'd like to enter questions as you hear or inspired um, by what you hear and are um, curious, please enter those in the chat. We'll also kind of open the floor. Um, the Seaport Museum's created a great environment in this series to really, um, you know, make this conversational. But Jeff, I, I'd like to, you know, give you the opportunity to respond to anything you've seen or hear to hear. Um, I do have a question, but um, yeah, anything that might be on your mind right now, um, hearing you know, a little bit about the making of Soldier Song or is anything that Jonathan shared? Well, um, 
probably the question. <laughs> the yeah, idea. sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I will say is that, you know, uh, when when Jonathan was talking, I, I said uh, out loud in the room while muted, that's a W, that's a win. I think, you know, every time that art makes it to the page or the stage, whatever its form, um, I'm on, uh, I was looking in uh, in David's bookshelf, which is what I always do. This is the Zoom universe, you know. You can, <laughs> I'm I'm like, what, what is he reading over there? <laughs> <laughs> and I and I saw some Ginsburg up there, and I find that as an artist, I'm just completely disinter disinterested in anything that is not, um, you know, so, this sort of self eviscerating art uh, that we see a lot of in warrior writers. Um, you know, there's just a, I live in Hollywood and there's just a sea of vapid emptiness out there. Um, but, um, yeah. you know, the, I am a lot, it, in, in, it, you know, it hit me in the chest when I heard, um, uh, you know, th through you, Jonathan, the veteran say, I'm going to kill myself because I've, I've, you know, I started this path when I got back from Iraq in 2003. Um, and I've been there a few times myself along the way. Um, I was fortunate in that, uh, and I had a crisis of conscience when I was in Iraq. I, I remember a moment standing there with my M16, just there was just nothing but flat emptiness in every direction. And I felt that I was a part of something that had not, uh, that was counter to the, the thing that took me into a recruiting office at age 34, I uh, joined the Marine Corps when I was 34. Um, and I thought, you know, your options are few there, young man, like you can start walking in whatever you think direction of America is. You can put that in 16 in your mouth. And I reached into my pocket and I had a pen. Um, I'm a sober alcoholic. And, and when I first got sober, there was a wise old man that said, son, if you don't put pen to paper, you're going to die. <laughs> And, um, and so I made that choice and, and I carried a little journal in my pocket at war. Um, and each, you know, the one thing that war gives you is an immediacy of life not known uh, by many that I knew each journal entry might be my last. Um, so over the years now 14 of working with warrior writers, I've, I've been able to watch uh, veterans make that make that simple choice which is beautiful and uh um uh and it sounds like and especially you know seeing what i have already of soldier songs and looking you know as i said uh, if you joined late I, I uh veterans have to mitigate their own ptsd as you learn over time there all of us even those of who, who of us who fought on the front lines of this battle at home uh, when to step away and breathe, but um, yeah, I said I wanted the question. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mean, it, it kind of ties into the question that I had in mind. You know, Soldier Songs is a piece that is an opera today because of uh, veterans participating in conversations with the composer uh, David T. Little. Uh, but what has been your own journey in talking about your military experience and, you know, how has Warrior Writers almost been a part of that, that journey as well? Um, yeah, um, well, as I I did make it, I was only there for two months, three days. I was medevac for after a non-combat accident required surgery. Uh, and, you know, we all know a lot about the history of the American opinions about that war as they stand now, but it was, you know, it was still, we were in a situation where it was mostly a popular war that I had just come from, but I uh, I noticed, or, and I returned to Los Angeles from war, and it, most everybody was just off to the mall. I had I'm the grandson of a World War II sailor who fought the Nazis in the North Atlantic, um, and I and they regaled me of the stories of saving pantyhose and Liberty Gardens, Vic Victory Garden, and. Uh, um, and everything that, you know, just the life in America was about the support of the war effort in Europe uh, and in the Pacific. And, and it didn't seem like that was the America I returned to. But uh, I also found that as soon as I was able to, wanted to speak at all about the war, that, it, you know, I was politicized. I, you know, if somebody was in support of the war, they were very happy to celebrate that I was a veteran and 
salute the Marine, an Alabama Marine. I'm like the prototype for their, uh, you know, their war porn. And, uh, and when they found out that that maybe, you know, that I that I had serious concerns about what I'd been part of, I was persona non grata. And the left wanted, you know, they, I was in three states in a day at some times. They would fly me all over to dog and pony their point of view. But if I broke with it at all, it was, you know, it just felt so disheartening to me. And I, uh, you know, and I was, I was at the point uh, of suicide and I met a man, Yuval Haddadi. Um, I heard, I heard his Middle Eastern act. He's a good looking fellow, by the way, and I, I'm gay. So uh, I, I, I said hello to him and I said, oh, you're from the Middle East. I just got back from the Middle East. Um, where are you from? And he said, Tel Aviv. Uh, and I said, oh, I was just, he said, I'd let him know I just was back from the Middle East. And he said, where? And I said, Iraq. And he had been involved in the Lebanon-Israel conflict of 93. And he was very curious about my experience at war. And so I said, you know, I'm not interested in debating the war. I have my mm -hmm. brothers and sisters still dying there. Um, but because I do appreciate when people you know, aren't just off to Starbucks and are concerned about this thing that is continuing to take the lives uh, of these Iraqi people. I got especially close to the children there. Um, I'll read to you from my journals. So we went to uh, um, we went to a little coffee house. I took out, you know, the sand came out from mm -hmm. my journal and I read to him and he was interested enough to ask me to coffee again. And I read more from my time there. And he said, um, excuse me. <clears throat> so he said, I'll, I'll stay in Los Angeles on my own dime if you'll allow me to direct you uh, and, and to give this as a performance piece because I think the people need to hear what you have to say. And so, you know, I, I, he said, and, and we both believed that somebody might kill me for what I was saying because I, I was, you know, bumping about, up against some very, powerful political forces at the time. Um, and he said, say everything you need to say in case they kill you on opening night. And I brought back something that was, you know, the length of Nicholas Nickleby. And we finally got it down to an hour and a half. Um, and I would go night after night and perform this in this off night theater in, in, in Hollywood. It was like rolling an anvil uphill. Nobody wanted to talk about, you know, they were so, they had war fatigue and, uh, I mean, I remember one night the, the, the stage manager came back and I, he would come back and tell me the numbers. And sometimes they were so slim and just the look on his face, I said, how many? Hmm. And he said, what? One guy. <laughs> and so I said, uh, you know, tell him if he wants to come back tomorrow, we'll give him five tickets. He can bring five friends just to hear, you know, what this one Marine has to say about the war. And so he disappeared and he came back and he said, um, the man is German and he flies back to Munich tomorrow. And I was like, all right, hit, you know, hit the lights. And so I did my show for that one guy that night. Yeah. Um, and so by being able to do, you know, the eyes of Babylon over and over, we did a, a production in nine cities around the United States in Dublin. And then the Showtime network um, made a documentary about it, about this queer Marine who <laughs> I came out of the closet on CNN under Don't Ask, Don't Tell and made them throw me out. I watched and, it last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, God dang, I was younger then. <laughs> and, uh, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I got on the board of Iraq Vets Against the War and uh, and ended up at, uh, I was really, I was just, you know, in, in the Marine Corps, if you're willing to give your life for the Marine next to you, which is what everybody talks about, they're fighting, right? Then just it, it, it sickened me and continues to to think about people taking their own life. So right. I ended up at a pure peer support uh, uh, veterans and allies workshop in Miami and met Lavella Kalika there. Uh, she had been involved in some of the peace work that, that I was doing. And we had a little breakout group that said, you know, part of PTSD is that an incredible feeling of disempowerment. And so they said, you know, in these breakout groups, we're going to talk about things we can do. And she said, we need to help veterans get pen to paper. And I'm like, big believer there. Um, and so uh, 
then Warrior Riders was born there. And so, you know, since that time I've been able to, you know, literally to work with hundreds of, of veterans and uh, I was leading the group there in, in New Orleans when the pandemic hit. So we went to Zoom uh, and uh, uh, I've since I'm spending my time between New Orleans and Hollywood. There's uh, most people because of the movie, the veterans that approach me say, "Hey, I've got an idea for a script." That's why watching, uh, you know, watching Jonathan's beautiful performance in this really gorgeously done film, um, and I, I realize we have a finite amount of time, so I'll, I'll wrap up this part with saying that another Marine who's a fantastic film made a, a, pla a raft out of plastic coke bottles and floated from los angeles to honolulu uh to bring awareness to plastic pollution he's another person um he and his wife have uh, acquired steve mcqueen's old farm an hour north of los angeles and they're gonna do uh uh among other things they're inviting me to come up and do some uh, some retreats there where we help these veterans because they approach me and say I've got, I want to do a script so either a short film or a scene from a greater a, a feature length film that they have in mind you know and actually shoot it there's lots of people out there you know right. uh, uh, who are ready to do it so that's where we are with warrior writers right now uh, uh, I'm gonna you know move my focus from heading the New Orleans group and hand that off and uh and start up this, you know, Hollywood to Broadway uh, chapter of Warrior Writers. Thanks for letting me go on so long. And I, I, that's we're here with you, and thank you for taking us on that that story. You know, I'd also like to uplift, you know, what uh, Gail has said. You know, this master film film was shot in in a very meaningful locale. It's correct. You know, the Brandywine Battlefield in Chad's Ford, PA, a large area for fields and forests that is in effect a mass grave um, of soldiers for from our revolution. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. We do have a question as well. We'll get to that, thank you. Um, but uh, you know, what you said about the the Eyes of Babylon, your your play that you wrote, you know, it's a one man um, performance, very similar like to, um, to Soldier Songs. You know, in Soldier Songs, Jonathan, um, then I'm like wondering if you have a question, Ali, but in Soldier Songs, you know, we have, it's a one man show. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I as a Babylon, your play, uh, Jeff, is a one man show as well. Is that is that right? Yeah. And in Soldier Songs, we don't necessarily track, as you said, a single soldier. We don't track a single life. And I, certainly there's a lot of a lot of reasons for that. But can you talk more on that intention? You know, how did you prepare for that in your role? And um, how did you also think about this uh, tying to our theme of the journey home? Because we have multiple soldiers, um, how are you kind of thinking about that in the creation process or even as you look at the film now? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, oh man. <laughs> it's not, it's not one soldier. And I think that that's important. Um, but how did you prepare for that? Um, yeah, I'd say that like, you know, this it's, it is a bit daunting at first to think, okay, how do I tell, uh, this story through, through one lens being that it's a one person opera, but it's also, uh, it, it's almost like, you know, an hour is not enough time. <laughs> so it's uh what 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 i was talking to uh, david t little the composer about beforehand is that this idea that you know the 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 modern veteran has a very wide range of people and, and glennis we had talked about this before too it's 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 uh you know although i'm a a, a white male that's definitely not what every veteran is veterans come in all shapes, sizes, gender, orientation, everything. Um, and this idea that getting getting everybody's point of view in some way through there was, I mean, it, it's difficult. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard and I hope it it came through in, in some sense, but you know, it's uh, just learning as much and listening as much as possible, I'd say how I kind of hope to prepare. And it's it's more of a matter of just paying attention and listening rather than uh, and letting it kind of like soak in and hopeful hoping that that comes through in the 
portrayal. Uh, you know, Jeff and Jonathan, I really, I appreciate both of you being here very much. And um, I actually have a question for, for Jeff primarily, but then also for Jonathan um, and thinking about what both of you have said um, and thinking about, you know, this idea that we as Americans are sort of socialized to have one sort of stereotypical idea of who a veteran might be. And then in recognizing that that's, you know, not actually true for, for who our, our veterans are. Um, and then thinking about this broader theme of a difficult journey home, I think Jeff, you started to really touch on this and I'm glad that you, you know, spent time telling us about your journey um, because I think it perfectly sort of captures beyond the data that we're able to share as a museum, sort of what we are trying to say and what we mean by difficult journey home. Um, you know, that grappling with what, um, what sent you away from home, but then what changed you about being away from home and then what changed you again by returning to home, right, is an experience that all of us at some point, you know, as humans go through, but that we know veterans go through um, because of the just intensity of the experiences that they have, whether they're away from home abroad and they're fighting, you know, active duty or they're away from home by just being sent, you know, to a base across the country or even just in a different state, right, it's still just a uh, an experience that's taking you out of your out of your normal daily life, right? That's shocking to you in some way. Um, so this is a very long <laughs> question. I'm gonna cut to the chase, right? And we, my, what I'm trying to say is that we have really good, you know, data that we can look at that says we know that the population of veterans in the United States right now is about six percent of us, right? And the population of um, homeless veterans is about 8%, right? So there's an overrepresentation of veterans in the homeless population. And we know that the fastest rising population of people who are homeless presently are actually women who are veterans. And both of you are, are white men. I'm assuming you're white men. You're very white presenting men. Um, and we have this socialized idea of like white men being soldiers, right? Um, so how do you think that identity plays into how veterans are able to access the resources that they need, right? Jonathan, you talked a lot about mental health and how, you know, resources are available to veterans, but how true is that actually depending on your identity? Like Jeff, as a gay man, did you find that it was harder to access resources that the VA was providing to you? Jonathan, did you like think about some of these things? How much did that influence your performance in soldier songs? Um, I mean, that, uh, that I, I don't know personally, because that I mean, you know, but um, I mean, all, all I think that I can say is that like, you know, uh, I think that the VA is, I mean, I can't speak to the VA, I don't know, I'm not part of the VA. But what, what I can gather is that they're, uh, they're trying very hard to treat everyone as as well as they can, given what, what, what is available. Um, but it's just that, like you said, the, the, the it's a staggering number of, of people coming in that that are looking for help. And I think that's I, as far as um, uh, orientation and race come into that, I have no idea what I, I'd hope that that makes no difference in in people seeking help. But that's not something that I know firsthand by any means. Maybe Jeff has better insight on that. Oh, um, I don't. <clears throat> it's a great question. Um... And because the VA serves a, a population of people who were in the military culture, which definitely comes with its dose of heteronormativity and misogyny, and uh, um, but I'm I also I, I'm sort of a straight presenting Alabama, you know the whole I am their idea. I'm six five, right? Uh, I was their idea of a marine, and it just you know, throws a wrench in people's work. So my queerness really um, uh, derails it for some people. But I believe, and, and I hate to say this because I know that there are a lot of great loving people who are working inside uh, um, the mental health part of the VA, but I've just had some pretty disastrous attempts at, at runs to try to get mental health through the VA in so much as I don't anymore. My my mental health uh, 
uh, the things I do in the way of self-care are centered in my involvement in the recovery community and uh, a personal therapist I see outside. I, I, uh, there's a, a great organization called the Soldiers Project um, that is outside the, con you know, the uh, sort of the part of the VA. Uh, but I, I, I don't know if it's just, um, you know, the need is so overwhelming or, 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 or what. I was, i I'd had such bad experiences that I was reticent one more time, but I came back, you know, uh, I came home bloody from an altercation one night. And my friend's like, come on, man, you, you got to. And I tried to plug back into the VA and I got an appointment and I lost the sheet. And so I called and I happened to have my video journal running. I kept I have thousands of hours of video journal and I got bumped around on hold like seven times, honestly, I was on one to the next. They were trying to, I was like, I have an appointment. I know it's coming up uh, and I really need to make it. Can you help me find out where, you know, where it is? And the last, it was in New Orleans. And the last lady said, it was during Mardi Gras. And she said, they've all gone to the parade. You'll have to call back Monday. And I just thought 22 a day, <laughs> like it's no, it doesn't take a a road scholar to figure out when you, you know, the last thing somebody wants to hear is everybody's gone to the parade, but you, buddy. <laughs> and I just thought, God damn it. They're probably like standing up and applauding for the local VFW that's going by too. But um, um, I do have some, I have a, a goddaughter who's come out to us as trans. She's 16. And, uh, and I have some friends in the trans community. And it seems like, while not perfect, I'll say that inside the VA culture, uh, they're making some serious efforts to be more accommodating to, uh, to us, what I've called, the, I call us the alphabet family now, that uh, there are some, uh, some real efforts within the VA uh, to be more accommodating. Jeff, um, I, it's amazing how fast time has passed too. It's 12.55. Um, I wonder if we could pivot for a moment uh, about the, because we're, we, this piece is a, a, about the arts. This is, brings arts into the conversation, but um, can you talk a little bit more about how the arts have been a part of your own expression? Um, you know, perhaps even beyond uh, your work in, in playwriting, um, how, how have the arts um, been an outlet for you? Um, well, some, I mean, I think the whole idea of catharsis, you know, is that the people go, the artist has poured her or his or their soul into something, and we experience our humanity through that. And that's been going on since man first crushed grapes or went to war, right? Mm -hmm. Humans have done that uh, since. Um, and so my experience of art uh, from... Uh, and I love it all really. Museums are like temples to me just to go in and be, uh, everybody goes to war. You've all been to war. Everybody in all these little cubes today, you've been to your own battles. We've all faced our own humanity. We've all watched someone we love die. Um, and especially now with what's going on in the world and in our country, I mean, it is essential we find our commonalities. And so if that's true, you know, it is so, I mean, all you gotta do is turn on a pay news channel it, to be shown how people are so different from you, essentially different in what they believe. But um, living in New Orleans, it, it is a place uh, that shows us that, it, that art is that connector for all of us. When you go to the streets of New Orleans, you have people who are living in those streets and you have the, you know, the people who are living off Confederate money and, and, and we're all dancing to that same music. And um, so for me personally, I have to say, it's not hyperbole that I say that, that the arts have kept me alive, my consumption of them and my participation in them. And so uh, I, I would be disinterested in continuing on if I didn't have a, uh, um, that continued relationship and yeah yeah i hope i can yeah. have it with some of you <laughs> yeah my I, I think i read somewhere that you were a drum major yourself uh back in the day yeah um <laughs> you know in the 
couple minutes, I wanted to welcome back uh, Glynis. Uh, one of the things that Glynis has uh, prepared for us to share is a series of resources to kind of continue uh, understanding uh, some of the themes of both today's event, the themes of um, the film Soldier Songs as well. And Glynis, uh, the floor is yours. And this is something we'll share via email with the group as a follow-up too. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering, because I did, um, yeah, we, I would say if you are interested in learning more about veteran stories and experiences, the best thing you can do is listen to veterans. Um, and so Warrior Writers provides a lot of that on our website. Um, I have curated a few that are about this theme from some of the artists that we've worked with that I've sent to Stephen that I think he'll, he'll email. Um, but we do have a few anthologies as well that are published that you can get on our website and um, consume them. Consume them. Um, talk to talk to veterans if you're interested. We also, I think I sent to you, Stephen, um, that will be sent out a, a tip sheet for working with veterans, which might sound kind of silly, but um, we find a barrier is often people don't know what to say, and that's all one of the worst things you can do if you are curious. And so we have a tip sheet that can tell you, um, help help how to have those conversations, um, words to use, things like that, um, questions, um, and also to treat the veteran as a whole person, um, just as you are, you are not your job, you are not whatever. And um, so hopefully those will be good readings for you. Um, if it's all right, I'm gonna put in the chat a link to where you can see all of our books. Um, Please do. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Yeah. So those are all of our published books. Um, you can also find on our website uh, performances. Um, we have an upcoming performance on Memorial Day um, called Songs and Stories, featuring seven veteran artists who are musicians and storytellers. Um, it is free. It is on Zoom. If you are looking for a way to honor the holiday beyond the commercialized, whatever it's become, you know, of course, enjoy your day off. Um, but if you want to be engaged in the conversation and hear stories, um, songs and stories, Monday, 8 p.m. on Zoom, Eastern time. I know we're all coming. And yeah. virtual. I always forget to say things are virtual because we take that for granted now. That's just our, yeah. that's just our life. Um, but yeah, so virtual through Zoom, um, hopefully, I think that could hopefully also be shared. Um, Absolutely. Jeff, you, thank you for putting this into the chat. I would like to give you the opportunity to talk about it. How can we stay engaged with you What um, to keep learning and listening from you, you and your stories? Uh, yeah. Um, after that first play, I found myself paralyzed to write again. Tennessee Williams calls it the terror of the white page and the typewriter. But I eventually did write this play called Lilac and Liquor. It's an unproduced play, and Glennis and I have started a conversation about it. The pandemic is, you know, uh, you know, took a level swing at live performance of all sorts. But uh, I already thought about it while watching, uh, you know, uh, watching soldiers' songs. Um, that maybe that's maybe that's its thing, but it is. It's the it's the story of the writing of itself, and it's a meditation on PTSD and the creative process. That's exactly what we're talking about here. Um, and I love the play. Tennessee Williams is a character in it, uh, and the man who had he had the former uh, um, head of Wyoming Shakes, uh, my dear friend Gregory Johnson did a beautiful we did it we had a live reading at a warrior writers event in new orleans uh, before the pandemic and COVID has taken his life a beautiful beautiful man and a uh, and a, a powerful force uh in the arts world and a you know and a champion of this play so if nothing else for uh for gregory you know i want to see this play come to fruition so uh, yeah. I, I welcome your ideas about that and your participation and your support of this play, Lilac and Liquor. I think, oh, and I'll, and I know our time is gone, so, but I do want to briefly say this. As we approach veterans to welcome them into the arts world, um, not everybody is ready for, to get in front of the microphone, but, um, and some people shun that, in fact, 
But the world of the military sets you up for the arts and entertainment world because you're given a very, very important mission, almost no money to do it on at the, at the soldier level um, and an Im impossibly short amount of time to do it. That is arts and entertainment, you know, so people can come back and find financial success in their jobs or whatever. It does not suit us biochemically the way this does. So, uh, yeah, let's get veterans uh, designing lights and costumes and, 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 and being stage managers as well. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you. And li li lilac and liquor, you said, right? Great. Great. Jonathan, uh, any final thoughts? Um, what's next for you as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I just kind of going along with the theme of everything, I'd like to kind of say that I'm what, what my hope is that with this movie is that as a as an artist in in any sense my hope is always to do art for a, a, a forwarding purpose of fill in the blank um not just uh, kind of for vanity's sake <laughs> but i think that art can serve as a very uh a very important tool in it in, in a way to like i mean this whole thing is of uh let's take opera in general right um what a big thing that we're trying to do in opera in the opera world is um is brought in the audience and and something that like david t little is very uh, into is is um along with me is using uh certain ways to to bring in people who maybe are a little frightened by the word opera and say like it's not exactly what you you maybe have uh, the stereotypical idea of um because i think that that uh you know when you see not that the great works aren't great in and of themselves but uh something like soldier songs is still an opera and and quite different and actually a, a lot of these new commissions on on the opera philadelphia, philadelphia channel are um kind of uh, challenging the idea of what is opera and opera uh, sarah williams actually said you know it's an opera because we said it is and I kind of love that because it's like, <laughs> what, what, who, who's to say what is and what isn't? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm. I have a couple of projects that I'm in in trying to uh, to get going um, that have similar uh, ideas. One one is this, um, you know, a concert of uh, kind of set in this macabre um, theme of uh, uh, George Crumb's Ghost of Alhambra paired with some uh, folk songs um uh that are a bit uh you know creepy just kind of um to kind of and 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 they're a mix of kind of modern classical tying in uh you know a much more pop like johnny cash-esque kind of uh musical experience and that's just like a, mm. a, a concert so that you can kind of bridge the 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 concert hall with the um you know the maybe the beer hall and they kind of come into one one thing and you know i'm also working on a project um with composer uh ian bell on on a, a piece about um aids awareness and uh um uh anorexia awareness so those are all things that are uh in the works and hopefully happening uh at some point soon wow uh well i thank you all um you know really at going back to why we're here is because of the invitation between uh, Ali and Alexis from the Independent Seaport Museum that they've curated this, this series that's gonna continue. Uh, I'd just like to extend a thanks to, to Jonathan for your vision, um, for uh, Jeff, for your, you know, picking up the mic and, 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 and sharing your stories with us. Uh, look forward to continuing to, to see what is uh, happening within your world and growing a relationship with warrior writers. Uh, this is a new relationship for me personally. And I, and I hear you, Jeff, about, you know, training and lights and backstage. And that's got me thinking in different ways too. It's a, Opera Philadelphia is a really vibrant community that's committed to new works. It's committed to, um, you know, connecting communities and building audiences through this art form. It's why I love this organization. And uh, so thank you. Allie, Alexis, I, I hand it back to you. Um, thank you so much. What's next for, for you? Also, I'm sorry, there's one more thing. If you haven't seen Soldier Songs, uh, there's a special promo code USS Olympia that's good through uh, the end of May, USS Olympia. 
will extend a $10 discount to a rental of Soldier Songs on the Opera Philadelphia channel, which is operaphila.tv. We'd encourage you to um, share that code, watch yourself and be a part of it, but thanks. Yeah, so just to echo what Stephen was saying, we thank you know Jeff and Jonathan and Glynis and everybody for being here and really helping us uh, you know shed light and continue our mission for the year of examining difficult journeys home. Um, the museum will be opening an exhibit on Friday, uh, barring any technical issues with installing it, um, called Difficult Journey Home, um, which will actually be aboard Olympia that goes more into detail about the treacherous journey home across the Atlantic in 1921. Um, and then part on our Memorial Day uh, ceremony on Monday, we are unveiling a new permanent historical marker to honor where the unknown soldier was laid on board Olympia during the transport to DC. And then also honoring the men aboard who risked their lives um, to, deliver, to deliver the unknown safely home. Uh, so we have that this weekend, which we're really honored and humble to be able to do. Um, and that's about it from the Seaport, but I encourage everybody to go to our website um, for upcoming programming and events. And we would love for you all to come see the historical marker and the exhibit this summer. Um, and thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye.